on World News Tonight. Morocco rocked. Morocco reels from the aftershock as the country faces its deadliest earthquake in six decades. Wrapped up. G20 summit in New Delhi closed as countries make efforts to enhance cooperation. New beginnings. Mexico en route to welcome the country's first female president in the ensuing elections. And Trop Loyal. French artist JR reimagines the scaffoldings of Paris Opera House as the entrance to a vast game. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are joining us on World News. We begin tonight with grim updates from Morocco. The death toll for Morocco's devastating earthquake continues to rise. Local authorities say it's the deadliest quake to hit the country in six decades, with over 2,000 people dead. More than 2,100 people have been killed and over 2,400 injured in Friday's powerful earthquake in Morocco. The 6.8 magnitude earthquake struck with an epicenter some 72 kilometers southwest of the North African country's historic city, Marrakesh. The deadliest quake to hit the country in six decades was quick to turn buildings and homes into rubble. Everything is gone. We lost everything. We lost our entire house. There are still people buried here in this house. They didn't get the rescue they needed, so they died. The United States Geological Survey on Sunday issued a red alert in preliminary assessments for both estimated fatalities and estimated economic loss caused by the quake. This is the highest possible alert level in the agency's four-tier alert system. This means, in terms of economic impact, extensive damage is probable and economic losses could range up to 2 percent of Morocco's GDP. The agency also expects that there is a 35 percent chance that the death toll could rise to 10,000 people and a 21 percent chance casualties to range between 10,000 to 100,000. Meanwhile, the Moroccan government on Saturday declared a three-day national mourning period as rescue efforts continue. The government is mobilizing armed forces to provide affected areas with supplies such as drinking water, food and blankets. The international community is also expressing condolences and vowing to provide necessary support to Morocco. South Korean President Yoon Sung-yeol during his opening remarks at a G20 summit session in New Delhi on Sunday said, South Korea will provide the necessary assistance to help Morocco's recovery from the earthquake. South Korea's foreign ministry also issued a statement vowing to closely cooperate with the Moroccan government and the international community to provide support. Turkey, where a deadly earthquake killed more than 50,000 people in February, is among the countries lending a hand. Algeria, which broke off ties with Morocco over a diplomatic row two years ago, also said it would open up its airspace for humanitarian and medical aid. The United States has also dispatched a team of disaster experts to assess the situation and to identify humanitarian needs. Other countries such as Spain, France and Israel are also deploying resources and personnel to provide necessary support to Morocco. Over in neighboring India now, Prime Minister Modi handed over the ceremonial gavel to the Brazilian president to mark the transfer of the presidency at the third G20 session. One future with this, the two-day mega conclave of world leaders under India's G20 presidency in the national capital came to an end. The G20 summit in New Delhi ended on Sunday as India handed over the bloc presidency to Brazil. While both the US and Russia praised a consensus from member countries that did not specifically condemn Moscow for the war in Ukraine. On Saturday, the group adopted a leader's declaration that avoided condemning Russia for what they call a special military operation in Ukraine but highlighted the human suffering the conflict had caused, calling on all states not to use force to grab territory. The consensus came as a surprise, with differing views on the war threatening to derail the meeting in the weeks leading to the summit. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said the summit was a success for India as well as the global south. Germany and Britain have also praised the resolution, and France's president said it confirmed 
Russia remains a global pariah. This G20 confirms once again the isolation of Russia. Yesterday and today, an overwhelming majority of G20 members condemned the war in Ukraine and its impact. But Ukraine was disappointed, calling the resolution nothing to be proud of. The summit's document has called for the safe flow of grain, food and fertilizer from both Ukraine and Russia. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan said Ankara, Moscow and Kiev would continue to discuss renewing a grain deal that ended when Russia pulled out earlier in the summer. The summit also admitted the African Union, which includes 55 member states, as a permanent member of the G20, underlining the bloc's inclusivity of more developing countries. U.S. President Joe Biden and Vietnam's Communist Party General Nguyen Phu Trong have agreed to elevate their di diplomatic relations to a comprehensive strategic partnership. The two leaders reached the agreement as they met in the Vietnamese capital Hanoi. It was Biden's first visit to the Southeast Asian country as president. In a visit to Vietnam on Sunday, U.S. President Joe Biden secured deals on semiconductors and minerals as the strategic Southeast Asian nation promoted Washington to Hanoi's top-tier diplomatic status alongside China and Russia. The U.S. has been pushing for the upgrade for months with a strategic nation in the contested Indo-Pacific region. Today we can trace 50-year 50 50 arc of progress in the relationship between our nations from conflict to normalization. Biden praised the upgrade at a news conference, noting the dramatic change from a half century ago when American soldiers fought a brutal war in the country. Biden arrived in Hanoi to a ceremony organized by the ruling Communist Party that included school children waving American flags and honor guards carrying bayoneted rifles. The focus of the visit includes another power to the north, China. The upgrade in trade ties could help strengthen American access to Vietnamese exports of semiconductors and rare earth minerals, strengthening a supply chain that has proven vulnerable to changes in China's output and trade policy. Asked about Beijing, Biden said he wasn't interested in containing China, but emphasized that stability required playing by the rules. China is beginning to change some of the rules of the game uh, in terms of trade and other issues. Biden did not specify which rules he meant. His visit and the deals brokered aren't the end of this story. Officials and diplomats said top Chinese officials, possibly including President Xi Jinping, are expected to visit Vietnam in the coming days or weeks. China is once again under fire for spy claims. This time, the allegations are leveled by the UK government. The UK government is facing pressure to take stronger action against Beijing after a parliamentary researcher was arrested amid accusations he spied for China. Rishi Sunak also raised concerns about interference from Beijing with China's premier while at the G20 in India. The Prime Minister said an open dialogue with China was necessary. Police confirmed that two men were arrested under the Official Secrets Act in March. Both men have been released on bail and the METS Counterterrorism Command, which oversees espionage-related offences, is investigating. The arrest of the parliamentary researcher has renewed a debate which has been raging in the Conservative Party for months on their stricter approach on China. Ministers have so far resisted branding Beijing a threat. Some cabinet ministers, such as Home Secretary Suella Braverman, are understood to support a tightening of the rules as well. Mr. Sunak said that he had raised very strong concerns about any interference in British democracy with China's Premier Li Qiang. But he also said that UK should not be carping from the sidelines, and it was better to be in the room raising concerns. Tonight's Road to the White House now. Former U.S. President Donald Trump is on what seems like a glide path to the GOP nomination. He has largely eschewed traditional day-to-day -day campaigning, and his social media missiles toggle between attacks on his political opponents and laments about the legal troubles surrounding him. But he's not taking his eye entirely off the primary. In fact, he and his team were heavily engaged behind the scenes. 
Trump has worked donors in an attempt to either get their money or persuade them not to give to others. He's had meetings with policy advisors and has churned out policy videos. He's done tele rallies and Trump has made countless personal calls to Republican officials like Suarez in an effort to win their support. The approach Trump's team has adopted in a reflection of the unprecedented and unorthodox place his campaign is in has publicly taken on the posture of an incumbent, privately adopted the mindset of a fighter, all while trying to avoid the fate of a convict. Welcome back. Charges against Trump's former White House staff chief, Mark Meadows, involving efforts to reverse the 2020 U.S. presidential election results will not be tried in federal court. A judge has denied a bid from former Trump aide Mark Meadows to move his Georgia election case to federal court. The ruling on Friday by U.S. District Judge Steve Jones gives an early win to Fulton County prosecutors who in August charged Meadows, former President Donald Trump and 17 others with conspiring to overturn the 2020 presidential election results. Meadows is accused of arranging calls and meetings, which prosecutors say let Trump pressure election officials to change the vote count in his favor. The former chief of staff could have faced a friendlier jury pool in federal court. It draws from a larger and more politically diverse area than Fulton County, where the case was filed. Moving to federal court would also let Meadows argue that he is immune from state prosecution because he was carrying out his duties as a federal official. The ruling is a sign that similar bids by the former U.S. president and his co-defendants to move the criminal case to a more favorable venue will fail. A lawyer for Meadows did not immediately reply to a request for comment. Meadows could appeal the ruling. Heightened fears of pollution in Japan as swarms of visitors on the mountain Fuji are pushing facilities to the brink, leaving mounds of trash on the mountainside and toilets out of order. Officials are now considering drastic measures to preserve the sacred mountain. Long lines, overflowing bins and broken toilets. Scenes you might expect at a county fair, but maybe not Mount Fuji, the iconic Japanese mountain, a sacred source of pride in the country for its symmetrical form. However, a recent surge in inbound tourists after Japan reopened its borders has led to extreme levels of pollution and other strains on the country's tallest peak, authorities say. Here's Masataki Izumi, an official from Yamanashi, one of two prefectures that Fuji straddles. Many people are visiting Mount Fuji and we appreciate that, but that is also leading to over-tourism with garbage and problems with the toilets resulting from the large number of people. We're now in a critical situation. Mount Fuji was listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site a decade ago, which only boosted its popularity. Though that distinction came with conditions that Japan reduce overcrowding and environmental harm from visitors, overcrowding has only grown worse. The largest base station on the mountain saw 4 million visitors this summer, a 50% jump from 2013. Social media has been rife with posts about soiled bathrooms and mounds of litter on the hiking paths. Authorities say they are considering drastic measures to reduce the volume. The biggest cause of over-tourism on Mount Fuji is that the fifth station up the mountain can be easily reached by car. That means we need to control that access. However, since the Fuji Subaru Line toll road is also a prefectural road in Yamanashi, it would be difficult to regulate it. So we want to make a drastic change to replace the road with a mountain railway. Another strain has been the trend of what's called bullet climbing, where climbers attempt to scale Fuji for sunrise and descend the same day, leading to a spike in rescue requests of 50 percent from 2022, with over 60 so far this year, and a quarter of which have come from non-Japanese tourists. Unless they find ways to manage the crowds, Izumi worries the world will turn its back on Fuji entirely. If things continue as they are, Mount Fuji will be abandoned by people around the world in the near future. If we compare it to world standard tourist destinations, Mount Fuji will be near the bottom. I have a strong sense of crisis right now. 
Mexico is set to make history with the ensuing elections as the country is preparing to welcome its first female president. Claudia Sheinbaum and Shotel Galvez are the main contenders in Mexico's upcoming presidential election. Their rise marks the culmination of decades of inclusive politics in the country. The stage is being set for Mexico to have its first female president. Claudia Sheinbaum was confirmed as the ruling party's candidate in next year's vote on Wednesday. And Xochitl Galvez is the main opposition contender. It marks an extraordinary scenario, according to Senator Josefina Vazquez Mota, once a presidential candidate herself. Va a ser ya un par de aguas. It will be a turning point. And if there was already a wider path where girls and teenagers besides us will walk without so many difficulties, without so many obstacles to demonstrate that they are capable, that they are intelligent, that they deserve it, this will change the dynamics of the lives of millions of girls and teenagers. Mexico is home to the world's second biggest Roman Catholic population. For years, it was a bastion of traditional values that tended to limit women's access to a life outside the home. But reforms to increase women's political clout were spurred on by the end of one-party rule in 2000, as well as global advances in women's rights. Now, women must make up at least 50% of parties' candidates. The country has its first female Supreme Court Chief Justice and Central Bank Governor. And polls show the majority of the public is ready for a woman president. I don't think anyone can understand the women's issue as well as another woman, says this accountant. The picture isn't entirely rosy. Studies show women remain seriously underrepresented in boardrooms and are paid significantly less than male counterparts. All while forced marriages of girls still plague the country, and violence against women is on the rise. While Senator Vasquez Moda says she believes the vote could represent a watershed in the country, others are quick to point out the changes that have taken place in politics still need to make their way to all walks of life. The Spanish soccer scandal is seemingly drawing to a close. Spanish Football Federation Chief Luis Rubiales quit his post after his scandal over allegations. He gave an unsolicited kiss to Spanish soccer star Jennifer Hermoso. Moreover, Hermoso received a tribute from Cachucha, her club in Mexico. On the same day, Rubiales announced his resignation. It's a scandal that has rocked Spanish football. After weeks of enduring intense public criticism, Luis Rubiales has finally caved. He says he'll resign as president of the Royal Spanish Football Federation and vice president of UEFA after forcibly kissing footballer Jenny Hermoso at the Women's World Cup final. In an open letter, Rubiales said insisting on waiting and clinging to his role is not going to contribute to anything positive, neither for the federation nor for Spanish football. It's an outcome Rubiales tried so hard to resist. A day after the controversial kiss, the football boss offered an apology but refused to step down despite growing outrage. Do you really think that I deserve this hand? People demanding my resignation? Is this so serious for me to have to resign, having done the best management of Spanish football? Do you think I need to resign? Let me tell you something. I'm not going to resign. I'm not going to resign. Following his defensive speech in which he railed against what he called forced feminism, over 80 players from the women's team went on strike in protest. FIFA also took action provisionally suspending Rubiales for 90 days. Spain's women's head coach Jorge Vilda, Rubiales' longtime ally, was sacked in the aftermath. Rubiales has insisted the kiss was consensual, something Hermoso fiercely denies. Last Tuesday, the player made a legal complaint formally accusing the football boss of sexual assault. Shortly after, the Spanish prosecutor also filed a lawsuit against Rubiales for sexual assault and coercion. The resignation is the latest chapter in a scandal that has not only overshadowed Spain's World Cup victory, but has been described as a watershed moment in the country's Me Too movement. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute.
The torch relay for the 19th Asian Games continued in Shaoxing City, east of China's Zhejiang province. The torch bearers come from all walks of life, including athletes, coaches and other sports workers, as well as frontline workers at grassroots levels. Hawaii's Kilauea volcano began erupting again after nearly three months of quiet, with glowing lava flows bursting within one of its craters. Kilauea is the youngest and most active volcano on the island, with several summit eruptions since 2020. London's Metropolitan Police have found and arrested Daniel Kharif, marking the end of a three-day manhunt for the terror suspect who escaped from prison. Record levels of rain have fallen in Spain, causing the deaths of at least two people and leading to travel chaos. A red alert was declared and the population was urged to stay in their homes. A Dutch ultra-runner completed an epic journey from Amsterdam to Kiev, raising money towards buying ambulances for use in Ukraine. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leading you tonight in France, as artist JR dressed the scaffoldings covering the monument with a trompe l'oeil art installation. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.